our guest Gary Wills would have us think twice about all the political invocations of Jesus that we hear in America every day these days. Gary Wills' new sermon of a book is titled What Jesus Meant. It's the work of an active Catholic and lifelong reporter commentator on American life. Harvey Cox is in our studio with another perspective. He's an ordained Baptist minister who for many years taught a famous course at Harvard called Jesus and the Moral Life. Pitch your own idea of Jesus and activism at our website, www.radioopensource.org. Welcome, Gary Wills. I should remind those who don't know that he's written distinguished books about almost everything from St. Augustine to the Gettysburg Address to John Wayne. His new one he calls a devotional book from an Orthodox Catholic. Gary Wills, what did Jesus mean? Well, he meant to take us to the Father through himself. I am the way and the truth, he said. And St. Augustine said, how do we travel to him but through him? And he said also that he has broken into history in such a radical way that all other values have to take second place to the ones that he brings, family values, community values, uh, all those values. Uh, he is a, a radical, apocalyptic figure, and those who would try to make him somebody who is respectable don't face the fact that in the Gospels he is never respectable. He is hated, he is hunted, he is uh, somebody who is rejected by his own family. They tried to throw him over a cliff by all of the authorities of his day. He had among his original followers no priests, no Sadducees, no Pharisees, no scribes. Uh, he didn't try to accommodate the authorities of his time. In fact, he defied them. He defied the temple, the sacrifice, Sabbath, the holiness code. Uh, over and over he was called uh, a heretic, uh, a consorter with the unclean, mm. with the, with the down and out, the downtrodden. Uh, he's not at all a figure that you can invoke for uh, respectable political purposes. That's who he was. What, what did he mean for us? Well, he meant that we have to look beyond this world to uh, the coming world of the Father, and the way to do that is to be incorporated into him. We know the Father through him. He's brought the Father to us. He says the reign of heaven is now here in him, uh, and it is with you. It is still coming, of course, but the seeds are there. Now, most of the parables are of things that are happening now which have uh, an ultimate destination beyond themselves. As St. Paul says, we, we are the seed and we will become the plant, the flower, at the end time. You, you remind us in this book, which I must say I enjoyed hugely, uh, that Jesus was not a Christian. He was he born, lived, and died a Jew. Uh, would he be a Catholic today as you are, Gary Wills, do you believe? <laughs> no. He would not belong to any church. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. Amen. And I think he is there with all those who are gathered in his name, my own Catholic brothers and sisters, and those of any other Christian faith. And his father is there in other ways with people who are not immediately uh, incorporated into Jesus. But no, there was nothing churchly about him. And of course, the very term Christian didn't exist even in Paul's time. It was a derisory term. It was used only by people who mm. were not part of the Jewish Christian, what we call Christian faith. A Christ Paul, called, right. Paul called uh, his brothers and sisters brothers and sisters. The word for what we call Christian was Christians was brothers or the holy. Uh, and it's often forgotten that when Paul talks about Jewish, about Jews, he's often talking about Jewish brothers. There were great fights between the uh, Gentile Jews and the uh, Gentile brothers and the 
Jewish brothers. And uh, he was trying to say that the Jewish brothers, especially in Rome, who were trying to exclude the non-Jewish brothers, were wrong. And so much of his criticism is not directed at what we call Jews. Uh, he didn't distinguish what we call Jews from Jewish brothers. Hmm. So he is trying to say that the the brothers and sisters have to follow Jesus's uh, way of life, which is a very exigent way, uh, a hard way. But the main thing that he says is, when it comes time to enter into the reign of heaven, you'll be judged on only one thing. You'll be looked at and it will say, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you've healed me. And uh, people will say, well, when did we do that? We didn't even know you were around. We didn't see you. He said, whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did to me. Then he turns to others and said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me to drink. So you do not enter into the reign of heaven. That is a, a demand that is the only thing that he says gets you into the reign of heaven. He doesn't say, what creed did you have? What church did you belong to? How often did you pray? Uh, none of those things. It's, did you treat the least as if they were me? So, Gary Wills, uh, how do we square that with the history of Christian power and Christian politics, even Christian anti-politics, from Constantine to the late lamented uh, William Sloan Coffin? Well, we don't. Uh, well, with we don't Coffin, square it, you mean? We may. Yeah, no, not with certainly not with Christian power. Uh, you know, the the American God, uh, who is often invoked now, was which which one? <laughs> the, he's the one who has blessed every American war. Every American war has been blessed by the American God. Are you talking uh, about Billy shows, Graham or? Or, or. Well, everyone from the revolution on, you know, in the, in the revolution we were told that uh, the British were Pharaoh or they were the beast from Revelation and we had to fight as warriors for God. Well, remember Jesus said to Pontius Pilate, he said, are you a king? He said, no, my reign is not of this earth. If my reign were of, the, were of this earth, my followers would be fighting for me. But they're not. Well, ever since people who claim to be his followers, have been fighting for him. They are clearly not his followers. The American God has blessed all these wars, and therefore cannot, the American God cannot be hmm. Jesus of the Gospels. But then how, you know, I, I, I want to get you uh, out of the, the pietistic or quietistic range. How do, how do, how do we account for uh, 2,000 years of, of Christian activism, of of all kinds. Well, we do it by looking at the Gospels and finding that Jesus was misunderstood by his own followers. Uh, there was very little of what we would call Christian church values among the the disciples. You know, they wanted the kingdom to be now. They wanted to advance themselves in the kingdom. He kept saying, no, 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 that's not that. It's not that. Uh, so we should not be surprised that that misunderstanding continues. His family misunderstood him, his people misunderstood him, his followers misunderstood him. Uh, and he he constantly rebuked them, don't try to be. He said to them, don't be called father. You have one father in heaven. Don't be called teacher. You have one teacher, the Messiah. Don't aspire to seats of authority. And, of course, they kept trying to, and they uh, were unhappy with him and denied him, uh, and that's been the story ever since. We're talking about what Jesus meant in the title of Gary Will's new book. Professor Harvey Cox joins us in the studio in Boston. He's a professor of religion at Harvard. What did Jesus mean, Harvey Cox? You know, I, I wish that Gary had written a book called What Jesus Means rather than What He Meant, because... Uh, it's awfully hard to know, unless you can see inside someone's head, what they meant by what they said. I thought this was a wonderful book, I and I appreciated so much of it. I do have a couple differences of opinion. I do think that Jesus was in many ways a political figure, although a political figure in such a different way, in such a radically different understanding of what politics is, 
that it, it uh, would jar and overturn our view of it. Uh, he, he, after all, did talk about the kingdom of God, asked us to pray that it come on earth. It wasn't something we go to. It was something that was to come on earth. We're supposed to pray for it. And, we're, and I don't think I quite agree, uh, Gary, with you when you say we're supposed to look away from this world. A lot of Jesus' parables were, look around you, see what's going on. Look in this world, see what's happening. The kingdom of God is springing, it's dawning, and you're supposed to nurture it and, and join in with it. Uh, after all, politics has to do with the right ordering of the polis, of the political realm. Uh, the reign of God is about that. It's not just about individualism. Harry Cox, I'm remembering that you went to jail with William Sloan Coffin, and uh, you were both men of the cloth who surely must have thought you were uh, serving God and following Jesus' example or something in that kind of work. What was the connection? Well, we sure did. We, and we were following him for the kind of uh, values that we thought he stood for and proclaimed in the way that he wanted us to do it, which was through nonviolent love, not through violence and not, uh, and not through conventional politics, speaking truth to justice, uh, speaking truth to power, uh, the, the uh, mode that Martin Luther King used. Uh, I think Martin Luther King's way of, of uh, entering into the political realm was, as much close, was much closer to Jesus than anybody I can think of. Interesting. Gary Wills, you, you express well, a... Well, go ahead. You, uh, but yeah. May I just say, uh, sure. I don't mean to lead the witness, but you, you've written powerful admiration of Jimmy Carter's understanding of these things, church and state, religion, or, or politics and morality, and the different demands in different realms of justice and love. I, explain Jimmy Carter as an example of what you're talking about. Well, I would rather start with Dr. King. Um, go, for, go for it. Uh, I went to jail twice protesting the Vietnam War, and I talked in the cell with people about the New Testament that I took with them with me, and my friends, uh, the Berrigan brothers, have done that. Uh, certainly, followers of Jesus will have attitudes toward the world. I'm not saying you're going to escape them, but they are not attitudes toward the just ordering of the polis, as Harvey puts it, which is kind of an Aristotelian view. They go way beyond that. And when Dr. King is defending the rights of the oppressed, that is a prophetic role that Jesus certainly had. And But it remember, it is saying that the reign of heaven is when what you do to the least of these you're doing to me. Now, that's not a political program. We can't tell other people do what we want you to do, have a really self-sacrificing love because you will be doing it to Jesus. Uh, that is not the grounds of politics because it means everybody has to have not only your Christian faith but your understanding of your Christian faith. Our motives will be, uh, if we are followers of Jesus, prompted by him. But there, that's not a political program. It's a prophetic program against politics, against war, for instance. As I say, every American god has supported war. Jesus did not, did not support war, did not support violence, did not support capital punishment, uh, as his uh, treatment of the convicted adulteress shows. So I'm not saying that there's a separation between the world and the Father's reign, but when Jesus, by the way, when Jesus says that the reign is to come and is here already, uh, thy kingdom come on earth. He is the kingdom. When he comes, he is it. He says, I am the reign. Uh, so it's not a way of saying a political program or a political regime. And unfortunately, if you start saying that, then you almost always get the kind of people who give you a Christian politics, so-called. I argue there's no such thing. You know, you you have a very active following on the on the blogosphere, Gary Wills. Frank Wilson on his page, Blog Sync, writes: If you take what Gary Wills says to its logical conclusion, then the abolitionists were wrong, and so was Martin Luther King Jr., because their socio political positions were grounded in their Christian faith. After all, says Frank Wilson, faith 
without works is dead, quoting St. James. And he says, St. James knew Jesus better than you do. What, what about this urgency to connect what people are doing with a mandate from Jesus? Well, I think that that's a Christian duty, Christian using uh, kind of anachronistic term. Of course, if you are a believer, your conduct has to reflect that. Uh, when, when I was teaching, I just retired, but when I was teaching, I would ask my students, do you believe in the separation of church and state? And they would all say, yes, unless there was a Mormon there. And do you believe in the separation of religion and politics? And most would say yes. And I would say, do you believe in the separation of morality and politics? And no one would say yes. Hmm. I said, well, obviously there's some kind of problem because many, if not all of us, have uh, had in some way our view of morality framed by views on religion. So our motives are going to be uh, religious. But when Jesus says that he, his reign is not of this earth and when he refuses to get involved in politics, you know, he, they want to have him take sides on the Roman imperium, and he doesn't. Um, he pays his taxes. He says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And when he's given a temptation in the desert to turn stones into bread and be a mm. kind of early Christian socialist, he says, no, 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 that's not what it's all about. Uh, so, of course, my motives, whenever I'm trying to be a follower of Jesus, uh, come from that fact. Uh, but that's quite different from saying that there is a political order that is commanded by him. I dedicated my last book to Dan Bergen, and I said to Dan Bergen, a Christian, he said, oh, you left out the most important thing, the adjective. What adjective? Would be. <laughs> We're all just <laughs> would, would be Christians. Well, that reminds, it's Chesterton's line in your book who said Christianity, what, 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 what is the line? He said it would, what a great idea. It hasn't but, been course, tried never and been failed. Tried. It was yeah. never been tried. <laughs> well, right. that's certainly true. Well, wait, Gary. Uh, Harvey Cox. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, I agree with so much of what, uh, what you've said and, and the misuse of Jesus and Jesus' name and God's name in politics. But look, to be against war is a political point of view. To be against capital punishment is a political point of view. It is and is inspired in you and in me, certainly by our being followers of Jesus. Uh, Jesus did, in one sense, did not involve himself in the politics of the Roman occupation of Palestine. However, he was gathering quite a, a few people around him, and the Roman authorities saw him, and the temple elite saw him, rightly as a threat to the Roman imperium. He was executed in a manner reserved for subversives of the Roman Imperium. Uh, they knew a, a kind of threat to their politics, which was, uh, in a sense, not of this world. It was so radical. It was so radical that it overturned existing notions of politics, just as nonviolent confrontation does today. People don't know what to do with it. Uh, it it, it uh, questions the assumptions of politics, but it does express itself in the political realm. Uh, and uh, the, it, Jesus didn't choose some kind of s spiritual metaphor. He talked about the reigning of God. The reigning of God has to do with the, with the social order. It's not just individual. If he had stayed away from all of that completely, I think he would have re lived to a ripe old age and died in Galilee, not being seen as a threat. He was correctly perceived as a threat to the existing political assumptions and myths that carried them in his time, including a divine emperor. Well, of course he used the language of the reign of heaven because he was fulfilling the messianic promise of his people. That was the language he was given. But what he said almost immediately when that came up was, you've misunderstood. <laughs> it's not an earthly realm. Well, why do you I say... I am not... Pray, 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 you're, you're, Wait my a minute, I, heard, I, I listened earth. to you. My, my I, I heard you out. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, my reign is already here. I'm here. And I am telling you that my reign is not of this order. Now, when you say it's political to say that, that's quite true, and I say it in the book. He is a challenge to all earthly polities. It's a prophetic challenge. And it's not 
entering into competition on the same level with other politics. It's trans politics. It's outside politics. It is prophetic, it, and it challenges all earthly things, and people who follow him will do the same thing. And that's what Dr. King was doing, and the Berrigans were doing, and you were doing, and I've been trying to do. Uh, but once you start saying, uh, we're another political position, and we're going to compete with you uh, in terms of another political position, I think you begin that distortion of the Gospels, which we have seen in every Christian church, which has tried to be an earthly uh, reign. What about, I mean, let's deal with the, 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 the harder ones, the, uh, the, the implication of a uh, Christian program, even in the Bush administration's uh, foreign adventures, that we are somehow uh, confronting another kingdom or, and, and doing it in the name of some, kind, some version of Christian liberation. How do we get to that? And what, how do we confront that? How would, how would well, Jesus we deal say, with that? We say it's idolatry, hmm. that we are making the Christian nation God's nation. You know, the evangelical scholars, Nathan Hatch and others, have said that it is idolatrous to call America a Christian nation. There is no embodiment of the reign of heaven on earth. Hmm. And to claim that is an act of idolatry and is taking the Lord's name in vain. That's what's fascinating about the people who want to put the Ten Commandments in courthouses. Mm -hmm. In the very act of doing that, they are raising a false religion and taking the Lord's name in vain, so they are violating the Ten Commandments. William Sloan Coffin addressed that very pointedly, and he was one of the few churchmen I read who did on 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 the announcement of the Bush Doctrine in the fall of 02. Uh, in which President Bush said we will be preeminent in the world and nobody will come near our power, William Sloan Coffin said this was a kind of reenactment of the temptation of Jesus in Luke 4, which you've cited, Gary Gary Wills. Uh, mm-hmm. The devil, taking Jesus onto a high mountain, showed him, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. And, and thou therefore wilt worship me, says the devil. All shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, yes. Coffin felt that, <laughs> that was... That a, was the vision of the papacy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the vision <laughs> of, of the Bush Doctrine, uh, entering Iraq in many ways, was it not? Of course, of course. You know, he said he has said on several occasions that uh, uh, he could not act if God were not supporting him. Uh, I like to contrast that with Abraham Lincoln, who was told by clergy that he should do what God wants. And he said, well, if God were going to reveal his intent, I presume... He would come and do it to me, since I'm the one in charge. But he hasn't. Uh, I, I much prefer Abraham Lincoln to George Bush. Come back to Jimmy Carter, if you will. You, 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 you loved his book on yes. our endangered values, and again, the balance, the note he strikes uh, in this in this realm. Pick it apart and explain why. Well, I always liked him. Uh, I didn't like some of the things he did, but I like much of what he did, and I think he's a way underestimated president on things like the Panama Canal Treaty. But uh, he, more than any recent president, separated church and state. He was a good Baptist. He is a good Baptist. And he did not say that he was there to do God's will. Uh, He's the only recent president who didn't have regular prayer breakfasts in the White House, prayer meetings in the White House, didn't have Billy Graham come, his fellow Baptist. Uh, and he never brought up politics on his own. I, I followed him in his campaign, first campaign, and he was asked, why, uh, why are you always bringing up pol- uh, religion? And he said, I made it a matter of principle at the outset never to bring up religion, but other people do, and I have to answer what my beliefs are. And in this last book, he doesn't try to say what, what he's criticizing in that book is not... American politics so much as his own 
Baptist brothers and sisters. He attacks the Southern Baptist Conference because it has made religion political. It has taken positions and claimed that they are God's positions on abortion, uh, on poverty, on uh, war. Uh, and he says they, they are uh, dead wrong. So I find him a better exponent of the principles of Jesus in the political realm than any recent uh, president, partly because, of course, he says this is not a matter of the political realm. This is a matter of uh, following Jesus in your own life, which means you may meet the minimal requirements of political justice, but you have to go way beyond that. After all, what Jesus asks is far, far more exigent. Uh, it's not true to say that I'm saying turn away from politics. He's He has a kind of things that uh, his matter of what is pure is not external cleanliness, but internal cleanliness of a, of a terribly accident sort. You know, if you lust, pluck your eye out. The, he wants extreme positions and and uh, hmm. treat everyone as if they were me. That's not a political position. That goes way... There's no party that's ever going to have that as its platform. I remember the details on Jimmy Carter somewhat differently from you, and I covered him a lot for the New York Times in 74, 5, and 6. He let everybody know that he was born again, and in, in fact, I would say he introduced kind of a certain sectarian energy, not sectarian exactly, but Christian energy into American politics, and it's never quite recovered. It and, and remember, you know, he used to talk to the federal bureaucrats, "Don't live in sin," and he he taught Sunday school. He was famous for that. Right. Uh, he taught Sunday school outside the White House, and the most famous statements that he made, like "Lust in the Heart" uh, and "Born Again," were prompted by people who asked him. Well, uh, I think they were invited to. But on the other hand, I, 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 so. I admire <laughs> the way you've drawn out his point about uh, abortion, for example. Explain that. He he would detach it from a religious kind of uh, urgency, but he would address the, uh, the the life and death point of of policy and the way it works. Well, he his position is that it's, there's no revealed uh, truth about abortion. He said he thinks abortion is tragic and sad and a result of mistakes and misunderstandings. But he said, how do we minimize that? He thinks, as two-thirds of the American people have for decades and decades, that Roe v. Wade should not be repealed. But he said that there is more abortion in countries mm -hmm. where there's not sex education, where there's not welfare for newborn and contraception is, and contraception H hold the thought uh, we'll all come, of those we'll come right back to Gary Wells after a short break we're talking about what Jesus meant this is open source I'm Christopher Lydon this is open source we're talking with Gary Wills and Harvey Cox about what Jesus meant Caleb Stiegel joins us from Kansas he's the editor of the new Pantagruel a Christian and rather irreverently conservative web-based journal. Caleb Stiegel, welcome. What's your answer on the what Jesus meant question, the connection between um, between Jesus himself and activism in the world? Well, uh, thanks, Chris, for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in august company. I, I'm afraid I, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate my protest credibility with jailhouse stories, but um, I'll do my best You're to young yet. You're sort of young. offer my lone voice of dissent here. <laughs> I, I think that, um, and as I've listened to the uh, wonderful conversation that's occurred already, there's a number of points of agreement that I have. I think Professor Wills articulates very clearly some of the problems with conservative Christianity, especially in this country. I think clearly there is a, a great danger, and the Church has uh, dropped the ball in addressing the danger of too close of an identification of Jesus with uh, partisan political concerns or with a national identity. Um, so there are points of agreement. I, uh, let me uh, sort of approach it by offering what I think are, are two specific areas where I, where I would disagree with Professor Wills um, and where I think he's missing the boat. First, uh, number one, uh, the Orthodox Christian view 
um, throughout the millennia is that Jesus and the church are one. You cannot separate Jesus from the church. You take Jesus out of the church and you no longer have the church and vice versa. And I think that uh, Professor Wills and there are others out there who uh, are crit- critiques of, let's say, the religious right and their critiques um, of of those who discard, if you will, the radical Jesus in favor of these sort of crass political programs. I, I, and I think that's right. Um, uh, but Professor Wills goes to the oppos- opposite extreme, which I think is wrong, of uh, wanting to recover this radical Jesus by utterly discarding the church. Um, and I don't think that you can do that. I, I think that it's interesting and telling to see how quickly Professor Will's rejection of the church moves to sort of these invocations of pet leftist causes and agendas. And I think the notion that uh, the church has essentially misunderstood Jesus for 2,000 years until uh, Professor Wills comes along to give us the secret meaning of Jesus is really rhetoric that uh, is in- indicative of kind of a Gnostic mind, which is ironic coming from an Aug- Augustinian. Uh, and it demonstrates what's really going R- on Remind here. us what a, what a Gnostic mind well, it, it, looks like. It's this like. idea that, that um, you know, there's a secret uh, level of knowledge that has to be a- obtained before uh, we can really implement the truth of uh, of any one thing. And, and that's that's boiled down what uh, a large part of Professor Wills' message is. And I think it demonstrates that what's really going on here is, uh, in fact, taking of this religion as politics game to a whole new level, which which I find a little ironic. And just the second point I'd make really quickly is I, I agree again with Professor Wills when he says things like, we can't do what Jesus would do because we're not divine. I think, along with Professor Wills, that the question, what would Jesus do, is incredibly short-sighted and, and ignorant of Christian doctrine. Um, I would just say that, uh, while that is true, an Augustinian ought to recognize that it's, that statement's a two-way street, and it's also true that we, in the now but not yet, must do things that Jesus would not do. So we are engaged in the tragic necessities of life. Augustine recognized that, and he recognized that, in fact, uh, you know, human beings who are uh, constrained by their uh, sinful nature and by their mortality of setting up systems which will rule and provide a decent justice uh, will have to at times engage in things that, uh, in the purest sense, Jesus would not have do, would not be countenanced, for example, by the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think it's Gary Will's turn to, to, sorry, to, go, to go, hit, go, the, go hit the ball back. <laughs> well... On the second point, of course, we are probably going to have to do things that Jesus didn't do, because that, and that's what I say. Setting that as a test, what would Jesus do, is a wrong test. Uh, on the first point, that Jesus is identified with the church. Mm. Boy, is that ever the source of idolatry, That to say that the church is Jesus. Um, that means the Inquisition was Jesus, monarchical papacy decade, uh, century after century was Jesus, uh, crusades were Jesus, uh, pogroms were Jesus. Jesus is not the church. Uh, even Orthodox Catholics said in the Second Vatican, Con- Vatican Council that uh, the church is the people of God. Now, Church in the New Testament is a non-term. What, what it says is ecclesia, gatherings. And Paul's gatherings were that, just gatherings. And he addressed the brothers of the gatherings. He didn't address any leader in those gatherings. He never does that. He never calls himself a priest or anybody else around him a priest, any of his helpers, any of the people in the gatherings that he addresses. Now, the gatherings are uh, the mystical members of the body of Jesus, They are uh, the people who pulled together and tried to decide how they could follow, and they did decide things like the canon of Scripture. They did decide on the creed. They did decide on the councils. Uh, So there is um, the mystical members of Jesus, but the church, uh, which is often the church state, is uh, idolatrous. And Jesus himself... Uh, never set up any kind of church. Uh, He said to Peter, uh, I'll build up my gatherings on you. And he said to the whole disciples, uh, and not only to Peter, uh, what you bind will have been bound in heaven, what you loose will have been bound in heaven. 
and that he'll send the champion, the uh, paraclete, who will stand with you and inspire you. But churchiness is the enemy of uh, Jesus. And to the mere translation of ecclesia as church has set people off on a wrong track down through the ages. You, you've, um, you're an Orthodox Catholic, Gary, but you have not submitted this book for uh, the, the nihil obstat or <laughs> imprimatur of, of the church then. Yeah, you know, it's, Nobody it's does that wonder, anymore. <laughs> it's a wonderful book, Gary. I want to really congratulate Har- Harvey you. Harvey Cox. It's a wonderful Don't book. Don't go away, Kevin. Because of what you're warning against, which is baptizing particular political programs in the name of Jesus or in the name of God, I couldn't agree more. I agree completely that identifying Jesus with the church is an awful mistake. Uh, you said a little while back you didn't want the book to discourage people from getting into politics, Christian people, from getting into politics based on their understanding of their faith. Now, see, my worry about your book is I'm afraid some people are going to read it that way. Some people are going to read it that way. And there are just enough people around who want to say, look, uh, you can't really do anything. What can you do about the war? What can you do about racism? What can you do about poverty? In our world, you have to get into the political realm to confront those things. Don't baptize your particular program or answer, for heaven's sake, but uh, don't be ashamed that your motivation comes from your understanding of Jesus and his values and that you're a follower of Jesus. It's interesting. An Ethiopian Christian cab driver said that to me yesterday about the war in Iraq. Jesus, you know, he, he said, uh, would not have been interested. There are wars and rumors of wars, you know, let it go. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I think that is a that is a, a way to read this book, Gary, and I don't think it's uh, what you mean. Definitely not. If After all, if you, are following, if you are following Jesus, he says, turn the other cheek, that you have to have an attitude toward war, toward violence, toward capital punishment, toward all those things. Yeah, and I would and just jump in. that you will go way beyond the political questions, and a fortiori, you will, on the political level, be acting in a moral way. Caleb, go for it. I just had to call. I, I see, I understand where Professor Wills is coming. I see very little difference, however, between his own baptizing of particular uh, a particular agenda with those he criticizes who do exactly Turn the other the cheek thing. is not my particular agenda, it's Jesus's. <laughs> uh, well, and, and let, me, let me respond, if I could, to the question of uh, identity with the Church. I think uh, what was being described is not exactly what I had in mind. I, I certainly uh, agree that the historical process of figuring out uh, what the Church is and, and what it stands for and, 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 and how it speaks is a very messy and historically contingent process. However, um, uh, I think that it, and Professor Wills laid out the doctrine very clearly, Jesus himself established that he and the Church would be one. Um, That is not to say that they are identical or that every uh, worldly incarnation that calls itself the Church gets to be one with Jesus. However, I think that what we're doing, or the danger here is to fall into the trap of saying that because Jesus... Uh, sort of explodes every human pigeonhole that we might put him in, and, and, I, and he does do that. But the danger is to then therefore say that we can't know anything about him and deny that the historical church has any authoritative ability to say anything meaningful about Jesus. And I think when you do this, you make Jesus essentially the puppet of your own desire, uh, and, and you're, you become unmoored from any divinely sanctioned community of tradition, if you will. And you end up in a situation where everyone sort of gets to have their own, quote, personal Jesus, and they can invest him with whatever meaning happens to strike their fancy, and I really find that to be the situation that, that Mr. Wills is in. Caleb, don't go away. Gary Wills, hold your fire. Our blogger-in-chief, Brendan Greeley, is, is reading the, the blog wins. Brendan, what do you see? Peggy Sue logged on earlier this afternoon. Uh, in a previous show that we did on hip-hop, she heard mention of the song Jesus Walks by Kanye West. She doesn't normally listen to hip-hop. Uh, but she got the song, she listened to it, and she writes it was it's the most moving testimony to the living Christ I've ever heard. So uh, inspired by that, she built a Jesus playlist and shared it with us. Uh, appropriately enough to what Caleb was just talking about, the first song on her list is Johnny Cash's Personal Jesus. Uh, there's also a song from Roseanne Cash. There's Elvis Presley's Amazing Grace and from Willie Nelson, Shall We Gather at the River. Right after that, Jitney Sound logged on and asked how you could possibly make a Jesus-themed playlist and leave off Mahalia Jackson. Mm. 
But we've got a question, uh, a very simple one, and we can throw it at all three guests from Avik Fritz. It reads as follows. Is there any aspect of Jesus that every Christian can agree with? <laughs> well, I think I can answer that. Go for it, Kevin. I think that, uh, and I think Professor Wills would, would agree with me, that Jesus was, uh, in, a, in a way that we don't understand fully with our reason, he was the divine son of God. I have a very simple answer, the creed. Uh, and I uh, would agree with that. That's what well. a, Christian, a Christian believes in the creed. Uh, that's, you know, as simple as it gets. I, I have a different view of that since I was not raised in a creedal church being a Baptist. Follow me. Follow me. That's what he said. How about That'll feed my it. lambs? <laughs> feed my lambs. Follow me. That's, yep. uh, uh, there, there, there are millions of Christians in this country mm. who are not, do not belong to creedal churches but believe that following Jesus is the thing that we all should be agreeing on and trying to do. Nonetheless, begs, our understanding, our understanding of Jesus was established by the tradition which chose the canon of the Gospels. Uh, that is an act of the community. And uh, so in that sense, of course, I do believe in the Christian community and the gatherings. Uh, we, the only reason we have the Gospels is that the early Christians got together and decided this is what we believe. Uh, so there is a, uh, an implicit traditional creed in that very act. What do we mean, Harvey Cox, by following him? That, that's a lifelong quest, Chris. That's something you have to keep asking yourself in every situation. Uh, I keep going back since this is Holy Week to what happened on Palm Sunday, that first Palm Sunday, when Jesus could have crept quietly into Jerusalem, but instead he flaunted caricatured the Roman occupying power. Uh, now, you can call that a political act or not a political act, a subversive act. It had political overtones, implications. And he knew it. He knew he was getting himself in trouble with the political authorities when he did that, as well as the religious authorities. Sometimes we have to do that. And I, Well, I, I, I agree with Bishop N.T. Wright that that was not a Roman triumph. That was a deeply, deeply scriptural messianic entry that had been prophesied in many, many ways. And what he meant is that the Messiah is not someone who's coming to an earthly triumph. He was redefining messiahship. And that's what the whole uh, well, he was, entry on Palm Sunday was. He was also taunting the Romans, and they knew it. If he hadn't done it that way, they would hardly have noticed him. But when somebody enters <laughs> Jerusalem and is hailed as king, and you already have a king, you have a king called Caesar, this is going to get you in deep political trouble. Gary. But he never agreed with anybody who called him king. He rebuked the disciples. He told Pilate that's not the case. And he didn't have to flaunt his authority. He was hunted all through his active ministry. Uh, Herod was after him. They, all, they were all after him. And when he is asked to go back toward Jerusalem by Lazarus' sisters, the disciples say, you're going to your death. And he says, I'm going. And James says, well, we'll go with you and die. That's hardly a Roman triumph. No, I'm saying it's a caricature. <laughs> it's a put-down, send-up of a Roman triumph. And was understood I think that, reduces, that reduces the scripture dr drastically. Well, no, it was much more than that. I agree with you that it's much more than that, but certainly that's part of what it was. Caleb Stiegel, what is your notion of a Jesus program for these times? Well, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean by a Jesus program. Well, I, I wanted to, not to say a Christian program, but, you know... You mean a political agenda? A social agenda, a justice agenda, uh, a human agenda. Well, uh, I, I think that... A um, kingdom agenda, whatever. Uh, I'm going to agree again with uh, with what Professor Wilda said, that there is a real danger with coming out with a uh, political platform and baptizing it as the Christian agenda. I think that uh, natural law and natural reason does play a very large role in our uh, common order, the ordering of our common life together. And I do think that there has to be a way to arrive at a political language which everyone can at least uh, in principle partake of. Um, certainly from a Christian point of view, uh, the way that one engages in that discussion, in that political realm, will be 
uh, guided by 2,000 years of Christian history, by the person of Jesus, uh, and by the community of belief. Um, you know, beyond you that, I can prayer, certainly discuss instance? specific issues. However, I, you know, I, I think that at that point you begin to wander from the religious into the expressly political. Gary Wills, you get the last minute. Well, I suppose some people would say public prayer is a clear Jesus mandate. The trouble with that is that uh, the Gospel of Matthew says, when you pray, do not do it in public like the hypocrites. Go into your inmost chamber and lock the door and pray in hiding to your Father. This is one of many, many passages where he says that religion is an entirely internal matter. It's not a matter of external things. He says what is unclean is not what you take into your mouth, but what comes out of your mouth. It's a deeply, deeply anti-institutional hmm. uh, gospel. And uh, we get on the wrong track the minute we stop looking at that fact. Gary Wills, thank you for a wonderful book and a wonderful hour. The book is called What Jesus Meant. 